I know you had an agenda, but I want to talk about Paul Pierce. See, I, I see, Kwani, I knew that we were going to go there. Uh, okay. And I did not say anything to you before we started because I was going to go there. But since Great since line. you put that meat since you put that meat on the table, let, let's just take a little, little sample. OK, in, in case anyone has been on a rock for the last 72 hours, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Pierce has reportedly been let go by ESPN after a video surfaced uh that had it look like him playing a card game and there were some exotic dancers in the backdrop and that was a little bit too much for apparently for the folks at, at mickey world yeah and they decided to cut the truth loose now i've got some pretty strong feelings about this now first of all whether you agree or disagree with, with that whole scene playing out the, the right. issue that I, th I think people need to, to be mindful of was the reason why he has been reportedly let go wasn't because of what they saw, but the fact, no, well, it wasn't because of what he did, but because it was what they saw him doing. If, because yeah. we, we, I've had a number of conversations with folks about this over the last couple of days. And the one thing we all came back thinking was that if everything that happened that we saw on camera happened and we never saw it, would Paul Pierce still be with ESPN now? And I'm convinced he would be. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I mean, this Absolutely. is literally yeah, an example of, of where optics matter. Right. And the, the point I was going to make is the fact that this happens on a more of a regular basis than people want to admit. So the it was more of you got caught and we feel the need to penalize you for it. But he was. it looked like he was just having a good time with his boys. That's all I'm going to say. The, the bottom line in, in all this is, is as much as, you know, we love Paul Pierce, this was a situation where, in the letter of the law, he was good, but in a court of public opinion, not so much. And and that's why, you know, him and ESPN, uh, you know, clearly uh, had the part ways. Uh, you hate to see that happen. Uh, but but again, that's just where things are uh, in, in the world we live in. So, you know, uh, still, I wish the best of luck to the truth. Uh, I, I feel like I said, I fully expect him to bounce back and be all right. Uh, and, you know, hopefully he'll he'll land somewhere else and, and kind of come keep building on some of the good things I thought he was doing uh, over at ESPN, so. Yeah, I'm not worried yeah. about him at all. And as you mentioned, I said this in my one of my group chats, like, I think it was because of the Twitter blowback. And, and someone pointed out the fact that that live, that Instagram live, only had about 300 people watching it in the moment. Right. But it was because someone screen grabbed it, put it on Twitter, and that's how it ended up going viral. So if social media hadn't picked it up in that sense, he probably would have even flown under the radar in that sense as well. But... Social yeah. media, the feds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 so you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Paul, you know, he wherever he winds up, he'll 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 fit in fine. But I'm I'm more concerned about the Boston Celtics and how they're fitting in with this kind of with where they are now. The, the new guys have been here long enough where they're not so new anymore. Uh, Evan yeah. Fournier it shook off that O for first game shooting. He's been really good ever since. But now, again, this is another one of those one step forward, two step backs, or however you want to describe it, not going to play against the Sixers. He's back in the health and safety protocol. Uh, it's the second time, I think, in the last six games or six days, something to that effect where he's in that. And, you know, it, it seems like the Celtics, they just can't catch a damn break. Uh, yeah. It's like just when they start to seem like they're about to turn a corner, something that uh, is out of their control kind of pre presents a, another obstacle for them. Another thing that was on my radar when it comes to the Celtics team was one specific player who has a chip on his shoulder because the media has been saying things about him that he doesn't agree with. I don't know if you've heard this yet, but Marcus hmm. Smart called you out specifically for saying that his defense wasn't up to par. So he said in most, the most recent, I think it was a post game or a, a press conference where he was hmm. just like, I want to prove these people wrong. So, you know, I know they're listening. They're, they're kind of, aware of what's going on around them. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are going to still talk because the performance on the court is just not to the standards that Celtics fans are generally used to. Yeah. And I, I actually, Marcus and I, we had a long, we talked about 15 minutes on yeah. Sunday after that. Cause the, the one thing was, all love. he was, I could tell he's not like feeling some type well, of way. Well, here, here's the thing. The thing, well, first of all, the whole part about just uh, me saying his defense was, was, under par, that was not correct. Uh, we we talked about something I specifically said that he took exception to, and we we talked it out. And there were there was no screaming, 
There was yeah. no yelling. There were no f bombs thrown his way or my way. We had actually a grown ass man conversation for about fifteen minutes, uh, and came away with a better understanding of what happened. And you know, again, Marcus, that's my dude. Uh, right. I, I'm, I'm, he's always going to be my dude, and we're not always going to see eye to eye, and that's okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. in fact, it should be that way. Uh, right. One of right. the things I, I tell people all the time was. If you didn't know that I was cool with Rasheed Wallace, you'd swear we hated each other's guts because we would, we had some pretty open, very candid conversations with one another. You can do that when you feel a certain level of comfort. So, you know, me and Marcus, we talked about 15 minutes and, and got some things cleared up. But, you know, the, the bottom line is if the team was winning more, this would not, it wouldn't even be a, a topic of conversation. Uh, I don't think his defense has slipped per se, but I think as a team, they are still trying to search and find out who their identity is. And in the past, it's been their defense. But their defense just hasn't been that good this year. And you can't really pin that on one guy. But certainly, you know, Marcus, whether, you know, whether it's said or talked about, uh, you know, he's going to get some attention for that. Now, is he still an elite defender? So, yeah. 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 Now, is he still an elite defender? Absolutely. Is the team not playing elite defense absolutely and so that in itself is going to create a lot of conversation and discourse but i mean i i'm a big proponent of players speaking that truth uh i'm a big proponent of players being vocal about how they feel because there is nothing worse than a player being bothered by something and they just let it fester inside them and they don't say anything to anyone so i, I respect the hell out of any player that will man up and say what they want and when i reached out to marcus i again he didn't have to pick up the phone. He could have ran and hide and just said what he said and left it at that. But he picked up the call. We talked for like about 15 minutes. Great conversation. Uh, again, we we got some things cleared up, uh, which you need to do from time to time. And I'm good. Uh, and I think he's good. Uh, one of the things I know neither one of us will, will let happen is we're not going to allow a situation like that to, to just kind of control who we are and what we do. Uh, right. That's just not going to happen. Uh, right. so it was, it was good for us to get that, that cleared up. And like, he's not the first player that I've, I've had to have that kind of conversation with. He damn sure won't be the last and that's fine. Uh, but the one thing I, I needed to make absolutely clear was this was not going to be Michael Rappaport and Kevin Durant 2.0. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It, you know, there, there are things that, that Marcus and I talked about that I'm not going to like get into specifics just because, again, that was me and him having a man to man conversation. And that's not for public consumption. But yeah. when I hung up the phone with him, I was good. And I and I think he was, too. So, yeah. And, and honestly, like I said, the way he said the name, it was definitely more of in jest kind of like you could tell he was kind of like joking in a sense. Obviously, you guys had had that conversation and people I don't know if people know this, but last year when he went to go march in the Black Lives Matter protest, you're the only person he hit up media-wise to get that footage and really just be here and, and hear his story. So I think that's a healthy media slash, you know, subject relationship where you guys can have healthy debates. And a lot of times the media are the people that hold players accountable. And when they hear you say stuff like that, a lot of times if they respect you enough, they're willing to do what they can to toot their game. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of glad that happened because it sheds light on the healthy way that people can have relationships with the media versus like you mentioned that Michael Rappaport KD situation yeah, that has yeah. been viral all over the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and that, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm a little salty about that uh, because Rappaport, he knew damn well that that was a private Ooh, conversation. Exactly. And, and that, that bothers the hell out of me. Uh, and and yeah. I, when, when players go at media types, when that stuff happens, I'm absolutely for that because you knew damn well that that was not for public consumption. Just like what me and Marcus talked about. I know damn well that wasn't public cons consumption and there wasn't anything that was nefarious said or, or anything like yeah. that. But I know that because of the nature of our, our relationship, professionally speaking, there are just mm -hmm. certain conversations that not everybody needs to be privy to. Uh, it wasn't like I had a tape recorder out and a notepad and take, no, we were having a conversation. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I think we forget that, these athletes are human and sometimes they just got to get shit stuff off their chest right. and he needed to. And that's fine. I, like I said, I, I'm all for players being straight, no chaser about how they feel about something. Cause I, I would much rather they get that out, get it out in the open. Let's talk about it. And then we can move on. So right. speaking, yeah, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead I was just gonna say one more thing with the KD situation, the, the, thing that bothered me the most was I got alerts from multiple sports apps saying 
Katie says misogynistic. I don't remember the other term that they use. And right. as much as the things that he said are on paper misogynistic, I was bothered, bothered by the fact that he eventually ended up looking like the, the you know, he victim, I mean, Michael Rapport basically made himself a victim in the whole situation. And for me, the, what bothered me is that you definitely provoked him for one. Two, Katie's known for being very vocal. So he was gonna come back at you, whether it was on his burner or his personal accounts. But two, the third part is just the fact that like you said, it was more of like, when you talk about the NBA, a lot of the crap talking that goes on in the court, we never hear about it as media members. And that was kind of the same. That was, for me, it, it was as if they were talking crap on the court via the DMs. And for him to expose that, I felt like that was really petty on his part to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're de right. There are definitely some things that, that Katie said that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, just because right. you just you just shouldn't I be saying that. But but right. it was said in a private setting. It was said in an environment that should have stayed between those two people. And if right. it bothered, and, and that's, you know, that was my issue with it. It, it just, yeah. it, should, it just shouldn't have gotten out there like that. Um, but, you know, it, it is, it's out there. We all know Kevin is is very sensitive to, to, yeah. to anything and everything. That's just, that's just how he's built. Uh, but this is one time where I, I you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm definitely in his corner on this one that I, yeah. I thought was wrong. Uh, speaking of what's wrong, mm -hmm. um, this schedule I'm looking at for the Celtics, it don't feel right. It, it don't does, feel not. good. It does not feel like they are going to easy breezy their way through this. I mean, we're talking about, you know, Philly, New York at home, mm -hmm. and then you got Minnesota. So you get that little dessert at the end of the road to kind of, you know, keep the palate nice and cleansed before you hit the road. <laughs> Then you got Denver, you got Portland. Then you, you wind up that three-game road trip with, with the Lakers. You know, for all we know, AD and or LeBron may be back by then. With the Celtics' luck this season, both of those guys will probably be back for that game. Right. Um, what do you, I mean, they look pretty good, you know, of late, but how do you think they're going to fare in this, this stretch that has a lot? Of, I mean, like five of their next six opponents, I think, are like playoff teams with as good or better a record than they have. For one, we have to talk about the health and safety protocols. That has been the biggest factor, in addition to them just not playing well. And if we're being real, it means that they are in contact with people or have, you know, may have tested positive, whatever the case may be. But that just goes to show that there is something going on to the point where a lot of players are not available throughout the season. And I'm not going to blame anyone because I don't know for a fact what exactly that is. But that is going to be a big factor when it comes to just the depth of their roster. And then on top of that, let's talk about the fact that they're basically playing in what I keep calling it baseball MLB type season. They have games back to back every other day. It's not a healthy, physically healthy type of schedule when you think about it, because, yes, they're used to like 82 game seasons. But I just feel as though when you're playing back to back or you're playing on the road or whatever. And then now you have the challenge of playing back to back. You might not have a specific player. And then Brad has to figure out his lineups. And then you guys aren't even performing the way you should. Everything is just leading me to say, you know, it, I don't want to sound so negative, but it all, the, all of these factors just make it seem as though this stretch is going to be one where they really have to prove themselves and, and dig into their bag and be resilient enough to get through it. Because, I mean, you're talking about, you know, ten, on Tuesday night, it's the Sixers and beyond. It's going to be a really tough schedule. And these are really good teams. And you just have to play up to their – maybe they'll play up to their opponent. That could be a, pl a plus. Maybe that'll be the positive side that we see because I'm not really sold on it right now. Well, I I'm going to go anti-Debbie Downer and, okay. and actually look look at this from a positive standpoint. And there's not a lot of – there just aren't a lot of positives that you can really take right. out of this situation. But the one thing that ultimately we all agree kind of determines this team's fate is what happens in the playoffs. What can they do in the postseason? And here's the thing. They've been to the conference finals three of the last four years. The only year they didn't go there was a year when they were expected to be there. Yep. Every year they've gone deep into the playoffs, it's caught us by surprise. And it's caught us by surprise because there were certain segments and mile markers throughout the season where they just did not look good. They didn't look like a team that could be among the last team standing. And then lo and behold, we get to the postseason – and all the lights come on, all things start clicking. Uh, they get some breaks with the other team, might be missing a key player for a game or two here and there. And things just worked out in their favor. And if you want to subscribe to that theory, there's a lot of ample evidence that will that kind of bears that bears out that this team 
maybe better in the playoffs than they are in a regular season because it's been part of their track. And the other thing too, and, and again, this is, you know, this is something that I've been thinking a lot more about your core guys are Tatum, Brown, Kimba, Marcus Smart. When you look at the amount of playoff experience those guys have, there's a different gear that you have to shift into come playoff time. And they're as equipped as anyone to be able to do that and do it effectively because they've done it before. And as much as Brooklyn on paper looks like they are head and shoulders above the rest of the Eastern Conference, and they really are, they really are. I'm a little concerned if I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan about whether I'm going to have all of my wonder twins powered, ready to roll come playoff time. Right. One week, it's a guy with a hamstring. Another week, it's a guy that's sick. Another week, in between Kyrie, Durant, and Harden, there's, they've only played a handful of games together because one of them has been out. And right. you just don't know how that's going to impact chemistry when the games matter the most. When you get to the point where you got to bring your, 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 you know, your Legion of Doom together and they got to get the job done uh, because – if I'm leaning on Blake Griffin to be like my number two or number three guy, if I'm leaning on LaMarcus Aldridge to, to carry me, we ain't going to be rolling too long. We are not going to be, we might get out of the first round. If those, if those two guys are like among my top three or four, you probably can get out of the first round, but you're not going to get much further than that because the reason that those guys were available was because they weren't quite at the level that we are accustomed to seeing them at. They they are on the other side of the basketball playing mountain and they're much closer to being at the very end of their careers than they are at the summit. And that is why Brooklyn should go into the playoffs as a favorite. But if one of those big three isn't around, no one should be surprised if the whole house of cards falls, falls apart. Because I really do feel that they are like one significant injury away from just everything just flatlining. I wouldn't be surprised by that either. We shall see. But we do have a great guest coming up today. Who is yes, that? Yes, yes, we, we we do. And uh, he should be here any second now. Our good friend, Leon Poe, NBA champion from that 08 Celtic squad. Uh, thought it would be a good time to talk with him because Leon, again, he's, he's another of the many guys in the NBA who, you know, forego a year or two of eligibility, sometimes three years of eligibility uh, to enter the NBA draft. And certainly a lot of young men are giving that a lot of thought right now after now that the uh, the Baylor Bears have captured their first ever NCAA championship, which was a hell of a game that wasn't quite the game I thought Uh, it was. It was. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible game, but uh, this is not how the script was written. So we'll get it. We'll get into that with Leon, who should be joining us shortly. We're just going to jump in real quick. You know, uh, Arizona and uh, Stanford had a great, great championship game in the women's side of the bracket. The men had a great one with Baylor and and Gonzaga. And I'm just curious. um, We all knew Baylor could ball a little bit. We did. But damn, did you expect him to, to, to put it on put it on Gonzaga like that? No, I didn't expect him to put it on Gonzaga like that. But also, when I watched Gonzaga, they got a lot of perimeter shooting. And it wasn't just three guards. It was about five or six of them. People coming off the bench can knock down shots. And on the year, they shoot 42% from the three. Mm-hmm. See, they was just shooting bad, but they was due for a, a good shooting game. Mm-hmm. And they had one against Houston, and I knew they was going to keep it going against Gonzaga. And what they did was they – I thought Timmy and them with Gonzaga had the mismatch inside. Mm-hmm. But uh, Baylor did some smart thing out there. They put Timmy in a pick and roll, so he's got to be occupied with the uh, with the offensive player coming off the ball screen. And now you just got a guard on the bigs rolling to the basket. That's easy pickings for offensive rebounds, putbacks, and, and you got they got whatever they want. Yeah, I I, I was just uh, I was surprised at just how easily. Baylor's guards could get to wherever they wanted to. I mean, Mm -hmm. they were breaking them down off the dribble, get into the paint, dumping off, dribble drive, penetration for layups, dribble drive, kick out for threes. And defensively, the the way they were able to get up in in Gonzaga's airspace, not give them, never let them get comfortable. Um, It was, it it was one of the more impressive games. And and frankly, and the thing, you know, Leon, and I, I know you know this, when, 
when Baylor lost a couple games in the regular season, it was COVID related. Uh, and, yeah. and, and so this theoretically was a team that should have been undefeated if it wasn't for things that were literally out of their control. Uh, so I thought Baylor had a, had a pretty good chance, but damn, I mean, they just put the, I mean, it was, you know, no, it, it wasn't close. Yeah. It, wasn't, it was, it was no contest. And, and when you got a, a lot of guys that can handle it, shoot it, pass it, they don't need no screen. Right. And that was the problem because, uh, you know, usually Gonzaga, usually they trap ball screens and try to do different yep. things, but they don't expect like, Nobody need a screen. Right. <laughs> and so they all can go one-on-one, and then they all can make shots at a high clip. Even with a hand in their face, they still mm. made it. Yeah. And so it, it just caught them off, off guard by surprise. And um, and remember, in the regular season, they should have played. They right. Gonna play. yeah. That game was scheduled, but it got canceled. And um, so they didn't really get to see Baylor speed. But they aggressiveness on defense – Oh, that's, that reminds me of them 08 days. I went back. I was like, oh, man, I like it. I started jumping up and cheering, but, you know, I'm from the pack. So I'm with the pack. But I was like, man, this is this is what you got to do if you really want to go out there and win. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And now that the college basketball season is officially over, there are a lot of players that have to make that real-life decision of whether or not they want to opt into the NBA draft or they want to sit out, sit in, uh, in college for another year. What do you remember about that process when you were going through it? And what was – the ultimate the factor for you to decide to opt into the NBA draft? Well, I well, I know most of y'all know my story, but I grew up with nothing. And so when I came in uh, to that college year, I, I wanted to go to the pros, but I wanted to do good in college as well. So I was like, okay, let me assess the situation at the end. And then at the end of my college uh, um, sophomore year, I was like, okay, if I go pro now, what are my chances of get pick, high pick, low pick, um, you know, bottom of the bell pick? I was just trying to assess that situation and what situation I could wind up in. But I wanted to leave because I, I didn't feel there was nothing else I could do in college uh, basketball because I was getting triple team uh, on a nightly basis. Still average 20 and 10, but on a nightly basis, they put like four or five guys on me every single time. And I really didn't want to go uh, go through another year with that, but I also thought I was ready even if I had to come in and, and, and prove myself and take a spot as well. So I thought I was ready. And that's why I left. See, the, the, the funny thing about like watching you when you were at, at Cal, Leon, was that I'm watching you play and I'm thinking, what the hell are y'all talking about? This dude got some knee issues. That, that, what? What? what, what, what? Oh, I, he, ooh, I used to jump higher. Oh, well, I used that, to jump way higher. Yeah. And, and the crazy part to me was even though in high school you played with a cat whose nickname was Beast Mode, you were the dude that I remember played like you were in beast mode. Yeah, now, yeah. Mm-hmm. now I, I, the, the one thing I, I've always wondered about you, Leon, was how did you not allow, you know, a lot of that negativity that people were, were saying about you? Like, he's a really good player, but he's got this, he's got that. Yeah. Can't do this, can't do that. How did you just kind of tune all that out and just, just ball out? Man, I, I fed off that energy. Um, mm-hmm. on my whole life been coming up, man, people telling me I wasn't going to do nothing um, wasn't going to be nothing. I grew up in foster care. Well, in and out of foster care. Moms, you know, we, we had our struggles. And um, and coming up in the Oakland, you know, it was, it was a crazy times too as well. And um, But people always doubted me. Uh, to teachers, classmates, everybody. Um, and I didn't start off good at basketball when I was coming up. I, the people wasn't picking me. I was big, but I didn't have no, I didn't know what I was doing out there. And so now I had developed a work ethic and I was like, you know what? I ain't going to let nobody tell me what I can't do. Right. I'm going to do what I do. But if, if if it don't work out, then it don't work out because of me. Now, I used to do crazy, crazy workouts. And I'm going to give you all an example. Is I used to work out with this dude named, we used to call him Crazy Frank. And <laughs> it, was me, it was me and Grunfield. Or me and Grunfield. Only two there. We run heels. We, we do timers like hours. It was like, it was no, it was no sets. And he had a big old puppy. He called it Puppy. I was like, that's no puppy. <laughs> and so they, he made us pull sleds with the puppy on it and him on it uh, for an hour, 35 minutes, 45 minutes, going up hills, down hills with big old medicine weight balls, two of them sometimes, with a strap, uh, a, a weighted vest on us. And so, and so I was playing games, and um, everybody was playing me in the game. They was like, man, how you how you getting this, this good this fast? I kept progressing. I kept jumping higher, kept getting faster. 
And they was like, how are you doing this? So I said, no, I'm over there working out by the bay with Crazy Frank. Y'all can come over there if you want. So next thing, little do I know, they told everybody, all the agents was calling my agent, was calling my people, and was like, you know what? Can we come too? Can we come? So everybody <laughs> came, right? And this is what I mean by this. Everybody came. And it's about 60 people. 60. And I told him, this ain't no, this ain't a workout for no, no you know, this ain't a small workout. Yeah. Now, where did y'all work out at? Where did y'all work out at? Uh, we worked out in San Francisco at this beach. Um, okay. it, it was crazy. It was, it was this beach and he didn't care if it was people there or nothing, but it was a steer that never ends. Crazy like, Frank, my man. It seemed like it seemed like it went to happen. That's what we call him. Crazy Frank he used to be a Navy SEAL. He knows mm. what I'm talking about. But um, so 60 people there, and um, we did the workout. Everybody throwing up, everybody about to faint. Some hospital, the ambulance was called a couple people. And then the next day, I came back. I always come back early in the morning. We, we get our work at me and Grumfield. Guess how many other people came back after that? Zero. Five. <laughs> Zero. Just me and Grumfield was there. That's what I mean. When people say they want to do something and you're not willing to put the work in, and don't get mad because it didn't happen. I was willing to put the work in, and I was not willing to listen to people that's telling me I came up in a foster system. I came up in Oakland in the inner city that we don't do nothing. And that wasn't true because in my mind, true, I, 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 I control my own destiny. And, and that's how I looked at it. And I, I was willing to put the work in and I did it throughout my career. I love that. A lot of times people look at NBA players and they're like, oh, well, I could guard him. I could shoot like this. But th there was years of preparation to get to that level, to be one of the best players in the world. People don't understand. <laughs> yeah, they have no chance. And and, and I used to, uh, they used to do that to me too, but I always kept some in the chamber ready for them. Right. <laughs> I'll let them come play me. And when they be talking crazy on the sideline, I'll let them, no, bring him in the game. Come on in. <laughs> because people don't realize, I, I look at it, I tell, I tell young kids a lot of this too, because your average dude, if, if the dude is the last man on the NBA bench, mm -hmm. if He's the last good. man, but you put him in a pro ham situation where you got to guard that man, and mm. he got no restrictions on who he got to pass it to and what the plays are that he's going to torch you for 50 points. Every preach, Leon, time. preach, every preach. Time. And then I was the wrong dude to pick pick on because I was just mean. It, it was just, I just didn't have I don't care if your kids was there, your parents was there. I, I was mean. I'd dunk on you, kick you in your head. I was mean. So kids, don't do not do what I did. But I, I used to always test these kids out. And then people that's my age, too, as well, be trying to think they can guard him. Absolutely. I, I I made the mistake of, of thinking that Sherman Douglas back in the day wasn't that nice. Oh. What? Mm. The general put in work on my ass. Yeah. Work my ass. Oh, and from that point, that's why, like, when I see people, like, challenging Scal and, and challenging NBA players, I'm thinking, like, let me see your money because I want some of that action. Because yeah. I know what's about to go down. And WNBA players, too. Don't forget that. Oh, yeah. You know you the little oh, chumps on Twitter. I could guard her. Okay. Uh, 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 I want to see you play one-on-one with Asia Wilson. <laughs> yeah, oh, ooh, that's tough. You don't know. You don't want that smoke? No, that's tough. Right there. That's real tough. Especially, you know, they, they got – see, the WNBA players, they got a lot of skill. It's mm -hmm. a lot of skill. And then sometimes they got strength, but it's a lot of skill. And and that stuff you can't teach. Like, every, every player – every NBA player don't have a lot of skill. Some of them have, like, brute strength. Some of them can jump heck of high. But some of them don't have like skills, a lot of skill sets. You know, you get a, uh, most of them have different things they can do. But the WNBA, uh, the women's game, oh, yeah, they got all skill. Mostly a lot of them got uh, uh, all different skill sets. Yeah. And, and you know what? And the funny thing about that is it's coming to light now and for a lot of people, but it's been there for a while. I remember when, when I was in Detroit. And Larry Brown, every now and then, we would just kind of, you know, on an off day on the road, we just kind of sit around, talk, whatever. And I remember he would at least once a week talk about either a college women's game that he saw, and he would talk about how, man, I wish we had guys who had that kind of skill at every position. Uh, yeah. And I remember every now and then he'd look at Chauncey and say, Chauncey, how come we don't got more guys with, with – with, with that kind of skill. And Chelsea's like, I'm like a two, three, I'm all star. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Come on now. Uh, yeah, but, I, I, but I love the fact that, you know, one of the legends of the coaching game recognized that. And now it seems that more and more people are embracing the women's game. Because I'll tell you what, um, 
Paige uh, Buggers from, from UConn is cold. But you know what? Old girl from Arizona, McDonald? McDonald. Yeah. Hey, I'll be telling people, y'all better put some respect on the pack name, man. People out there disrespecting the pack. I was getting tired of it, man. You know what? You're disrespecting the pack too many times. And we are we had the turnout in the in the tournament, all these under lower seeds and stuff like that. They giving us, they don't care about us because we're on the West Coast. Right. But look, the West That's Coast, right. we got something to offer. It ain't just because y'all got all the media on the East Coast and everything. The pack got something to offer, and you better put some name on it. Leaving them out of leaving the Arizona women's team oh, out God. of the video. Oh, I, I, that Ooh. was just pure disrespect. But that's what the pack been dealing with the whole time. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, they came out angry. The pack came out angry, and then what was that? What was that conference again? That big, what was that? Big Ten? What was that the Big Ten? That came Not so big. That, that, but who was that? The only one standing, uh, Michigan. That's about it. How many teams they got? Twenty in the tournament. <laughs> they gave them a whole lot of chances. They gave them too many chances. My right. opinion, but hey, if that's what they want to do, you know, go ahead. But the pack, we we stand right there, and we yeah. held our own. Oh yeah, Leon, we, we want your perspective. What is going on with the Celtics right now? <laughs> Broad question. Didn't even get to look, look. This this is the topic of the day. I I don't know. I know. Look, just check this out. You know, I gotta give y'all my analysis though. But yeah, let's do that. but um, I think the Celtics' problem is they trying to find an identity, and what they struggling with their identity. Of course, they haven't had all their guys the whole year. People been in and out of the lineup. It's been a crazy. It's been a crazy year. But what I've been seeing is. Sometimes the guys is not playing as hard as they need to be. Sometimes they're not making multiple effort on the defensive end. When you're giving up 50, 60 points in the paint on consecutive games, it's, 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 that's about effort. That's about people. You don't want people coming in your house. That, that's about letting people in your house and doing what they want. And I know everybody don't want to do that. And the Celtics sometimes, they do a lot of one-on-ones. It's a lot of one-on-ones. And usually in the NBA game, you only go one-on-one a clear out type of style basketball. It's like in the fourth quarter or late clock in, 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 in different quarters, shot clock running down, stuff like that. But the Celtics seem to go one on one, your turn, my turn, um, probably every other play. And it's hurting them and it's killing the offense. It's killing the offensive flow. And um and so they need to get a they need to do a better job with that. And but I've been saying this the whole time. I've been saying this every single game. They need to do a better job. We have beat some of the good teams, uh, some of the bad teams. But when we shoot a lot of threes and we hit a lot of threes, that's when we win. But when those threes don't go in, what do we do? We resort to this one-on-one type of I do it myself type of basketball, in which that's not going to cut it, and it's definitely not going to cut it in the playoffs. Yeah, and, and I, I think for most Celtics fans, uh, it would be one thing if this team didn't have good players and just weren't getting it done, then you'd be like, you know what? They just trying to figure it out. They're going to be all right. Cause they, they, this, they, that you, you can make explanation as to why they're not getting it done. But yeah. this is your core group has been to the conference finals three of the last four years. You've yeah. got guys who are under the age of 25, who've got more playoff experience than guys who are 30 and 35 that they're going to be battling. So they understand what it takes to win, but for whatever reason, there's a disconnect between what they do and what they know. And, yeah. and your point, Leon, about the three-point shooting, you know, one of the, th I don't have a problem with them shooting threes, but what I do, what I would like to see them do more of is make sure that ball touches the paint first yes. and force that defense to move a little bit so that if you kick it out for a three, then it's going to be probably an open one or lightly contested. Or if the defense doesn't relax to you put the ball in the, in the paint, Go for a layup. Attack them at the rim. Just yeah. do – and, and and to your point, I love end-of-the-game type situations. Yeah. When you got a guy like Tatum, when you got a guy like Jalen Brown, who you know more times than not can get their own shot off the dribble. And because they have become more aware of the guys around them, you now have to worry about them dishing to a wide-open shooter as opposed to them just going to the rack looking for theirs. They become much more – potent and again yeah. i don't think we're saying anything that they don't know but the, the, no. there's a disconnect between what they do and what they know how to do yeah it's a little it's a little bit different it's like you gotta look you gotta take a deeper dive into it right hmm. when 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 the guys are passing i, I look at I, I'm, I look at it in depth when the guys are just passing the ball around the perimeter you know you want to pass to create sit, assist opportunities for your teammates and what I've been noticing, they just pass them to get rid of because they don't have a shot. And if that's the case, that's what's been going on 
So now you're just throwing the ball back around with no continuity on offense, mm -hmm. and you're just passing it back and forth until the shot clock run out. Then Tatum Brown, you do it. And then we chuck up a three. And then the, the other thing, you said, yeah, you wanted to touch the paint. But I get mad sometimes when we win these games when we hit a lot of threes. And I'll give you one example. We hit a lot of threes with Orlando. We, right. It took us 24, tw made 23 threes or 24 threes uh, the first time we played Orlando. But guess how many threes we took? We took 54 threes. That's way too many threes. That's not going to happen in the playoffs. Even if you get into the play, it's not going to happen in a playing game. You're taking 54 threes. Against you know, Orlando. And yeah, and you live by it, you die by it. And that's a problem. We should have more versatility in our offense instead of just going one-on-one -on -one or just chucking up heck of threes and mm -hmm. seeing if they go in. Just because we can shoot it, yeah, any team, any team in the NBA can come down and just chuck up threes. Yeah, they got three-point shooters. But, no, you want to get some continuity. You want to get something going to the basket, and you want to keep them three-point attempts to a minimum. You don't want to be 54 three-point attempts. No, I like to see more free throw attempts. I like to see more paint touches. And I like to see more easy baskets and getting out in transition. They need to do that a little bit more. Yeah. I know there's no perfect science to it, but from your experience, how do you bridge that gap with the disconnect and then maybe get it to click for either them or, I mean, you know, from yeah. your perspective, how do you fix it? It's it's the mindset. And and I always mm -hmm. tell people it's the mindset. When I was on my OA team, it's the mindset. KG, Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, they can come down every single time and take the shot. But I had a post-up, I'll give you an example, I had a post-up, a mismatch. I gave it to uh, KG. He kicked it back to me. No, what you doing? You got the mismatch. We mm. going to you. So you take advantage of that. See, I need some, like the Celtics, they don't They do not do that. They rely more on that one-on-one -on -one type of game and, and heavily uh, shooting three-pointers. And and, and and when you do that, it's just you, you become relying on it. And then when you rely on it, now you live by it and you die by it, and that and that's not going to win the championship. That's not going to win many playoff games as well. But you gotta you gotta have responsibility too. And I tell everybody, I mentioned I'm gonna mention Gordon Hayward once because I, I don't want to get in trouble. But Gordon Hayward um, was the facilitator of that offense. If you look at the offense now, can you tell me one person who's a facilitator that's setting everybody up that you can trust and count on each and every day to do that? I don't see one person. I see a lot of guys out there jacking up shots and not saying they bad shots or good shots. Sometimes they bad shots. Sometimes they good shots. You just, you just never know, but they, they take them. And while the other uh, four players are standing on the perimeter looking like you got to be moving and doing stuff. But when you got that much responsibility, you get that much uh, freedom in the offense, Tatum and Brown. And, um, you still gotta be be cautious of how you go about doing things. That's what I that's what I mean by that. Going about doing things and meaning I need to make sure I get my teammates an open look. If I see my guy hit one, I'm coming right back to him because I know I can shoot the ball at any time. But I want to get them going because I'm gonna need them guys late. They gotta start thinking that way and, and, and start and stop thinking just in the moment. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And and when I when I think about it, you touched on it a second about about KG. And one of the things he gets a lot of credit for is changing the culture uh, around this organization. And you being on the team from the previous year, Lord knows y'all needed a change. Lord knows. And, and, and Leon, I, I, I give you major props for surviving <laughs> that train wreck. <laughs> I, hey, look, I didn't know I was going to survive that, man. I was trying. <laughs> I didn't lose so many games in my life. Right. I, we, we kept on getting pressure. Like, are y'all going to win one game? Are y'all going to break <laughs> the streak? You know we had a streak going on. Yeah. Was, if, if that one game we did win, I don't know if it was against Portland or what. I forgot that one game we were playing. We had to win that game. We was going on a roll uh, to go against Dallas and everybody. And we wouldn't get too many wins there. Right. So it would have went a lot longer. But that season was so long. It, was so, it felt so long. And. You know, we had a lot of young guys. We had a lot of people trying to prove themselves and mm -hmm. everything. And, and the culture was a little different uh, just because people just didn't know they, they future sometimes. They trying to play for contracts, playing for respect, and, um, you know, and trying to prove themselves. So it, it was all type of stuff going on. But the losing was just so bad. It was so I was coming home every night putting my face in the pillow like, I don't know what can I do. I, I left Cal for this. Know. I do not know. I worked out with. Yeah, it it, it it got so bad. I was I was thinking like, you know what? Maybe 
maybe um maybe it's me. Maybe if I get off the team, maybe <laughs> we might we might win some games. That's so sad. Like, so I called my agent. He was like, you know what? Nah, it ain't you, man. Yeah, you, you chill out, man. Chill out. Just wait. Right. Just wait. And what was so the biggest that's what happened though? But yeah. but the, the mysterious thing, I'm 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 gonna say this one thing. My brother, I always confined in my brother, I call him my brother, but he's my mentor coming up, helped me out a lot. Um and he said, man, don't trip. Good things happen to you in your second year. Every time I'm second year of doing anything, great uh -huh. things happen. And he always reminded me of that because my high school days, everything, we were losing a lot my first year. Second year, I took, I took over, and we started winning every game. We couldn't lose. So I said, okay, all right, I'm going to bear with it. Let's see. Then sure enough, y'all already know the rest is history. I heard about the O.A. Celsius. <laughs> Just yeah, a little bit. Know. It did all right. It did all right. Yeah, you know, the first year coming together, you know. It's, it, that's how that's how we did it. But we did it on chemistry, though. You know what I'm saying? People. Bluetooth. Are going, yeah, Bluetooth. <laughs> I can't be all I can be without the next man being all they can be. And, and, and that was really our model. That was our staple. But KG, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, those guys really bought in. Paul Pierce, if you notice, he was playing defense. He played some of the best defense ever. Yeah. I watched him as a young boy coming up. I was like, dang, Pete, I had to pull him to the side. Pete, that's, that's some good defense, right? How you, he's like, yeah, I got locks. I was like, well, where is where been at the last 15 years? Should have been <laughs> doing this. <laughs> he probably would have won some more games. But uh, but he was he was all locked in. KG, he didn't care if he scored 10, 15, 2. He wanted to get the, everybody riled up. And, and, and make sure he had his troops ready to go on a defensive end because he know you couldn't win championships at least uh, with, without playing good defense. And we fed off of that energy. You mentioned that facilitator. It sounds like they just need someone, even if it's, it's on the floor or not, to just really step up and take control of this team. Yeah. Who do you think could do that right now? Uh, see, everybody will point to Kimball Walker, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't point to him because uh, he's like a score in, in his mind. He's a score and he, he's been doing this for a long time. And so when you try to take a score to really reshape and try to be a facilitator, it's going to mess his whole game up. Because mm -hmm. if you notice last year in the bubble, he he didn't he was passive. He didn't know when he was going to shoot it. I was yelling at the TV. That's my guy, Kimball. But I was yelling at the TV, yeah. Kimball, we came, hey, you came over here for a reason. That, to put that thing up when we needed scoring in the bubble last year because, you know, Miami, they had a lot of players going on and, and they had a lot of players shooting, doing a lot of different things. And I thought we could have got that serious. But um, so you, you'll get a score confused to know when to pass and when to shoot. Mm -hmm. The main dude I'm looking at is the staple, the one that's been there, the one that's been the 10 year. You already know I'm looking at him, Marcus Smart. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He can, he can be that facilitator to get everybody in line and get everybody where they need to go. Like, you see somebody out of place, tell them to get no, get to the corner, spread out. Yeah. You do not have to go. If a player wants the ball in the post, you don't have to give it to him. You, no, uh-uh, clear out. Come set this pick. Uh-uh, yeah. we got more. This pick been working. Come set this pick. Uh, clear out. You know what I'm saying? You can do that. And like Marcus Smart, and they, they will listen to him. And, and yeah. he can do that. But he can't be the one coming down shooting all the shots, too. So right. you got to find some <laughs> happy medium. And, and I think Marcus Smart can do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't have any doubt. It's just a matter of just the buy-in and and whether they're you know they they're going to buy into that type of of leadership from him because he he's he, I think he's so good at that. I mean, when you look, when I think about where he where he began with the Celtics and where he's at now in terms of facilitating and things like that, it's night and day. He's so much better, uh, yeah. and he's still giving that giving giving you great effort at the other end of the floor. Yeah, energy on the floor every night when he, when he can. Oh, you exactly. Can, you can also read it on his face. Yeah, always. You And that's one dude you don't want to mess with. You, you, people right. see him diving for a ball. You know what? They they get out the oh, way. They don't care. I ain't never seen it. Mid-air, they leave. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> they don't want that but smoke? They, they nope. do not want to get hurt. They like, man, hold up. I got contracts coming. Right, right. You good, bro. Just, just, just take it. it. Like, we'll, get, we'll get that next possession, man. We good. You yeah. get that one. We'll get that next one. I've seen a lot of guys pull up like, nah, I'm cool. You got it. Right. He's diving on the floor head first. He don't care. <laughs> but the guys will listen to him. And that's what I mean. You know, you got to have somebody in there as that voice, as that voice of reasoning to get everybody on the same page and on track and in the in and out of the right sets. And if you're in a wrong set, get them out of it. Yeah. I've seen a whole lot of teams, Rondo and Doc Clash, 
because sometimes we wanted to go, Doc wanted to go get Ray Allen a shot. Rondo like, no, nah, KG got this mismatch. Let me throw it to him. So they class call timeout. And he was like, all right, all right, throw it to KG. It ended up working out. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, sometimes you got to have that confrontation. You know, you, you want to you wanna try to do the right thing, but you want to get your team in the right, in the best possible situation to play that, uh, you know, uh, that they can score off of or have the most success. Yeah, yeah I mean, it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier. I mean, having guys that care about winning, not about scoring, not about, you know, being Mr. or this, that, or the other, but just making winning plays yeah. uh, and, and that getting that buy-in. Um, speaking of winning plays, hey, Kwani, you know what time yeah. it is, right? Yeah. What time is it, Kwani? It's time for some games. We play it's games. Time. Play some games over here? Oh, yeah, we I'm play games Fortnite. a little bit. Nothing too I'm serious. Fortnite. I'm a Fortnite champion over here. We playing Fortnite or what? I'm about to <laughs> you know what I'm nah, nah, nah. Oh, we ain't on that? Okay. My nah, 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 nah. Maybe. <laughs> Those little kids be talking crazy on Fortnite, too, man. Hey, what they do. Parents, watch your kids, man. Because they come and talk to you. They it, it, a lot of times, they don't know what they're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Respect your elders. Yeah. But this game, the first game is called fill in the lane. So we just give you a scenario and you fill in the blank with whatever you think your answer will be. For this one, blank is your favorite Kevin Garnett story because of blank. Um, practice because of how hard he was willing to go. And I'm going to tell you that. I'm, I'm going to give you an example. And this story has been told a few times. But we try to give KG a day off in practice and let everybody else practice but KG. And what happened from there, Doc told him to sit down. And KG said, all right, I'm going to sit down. He was on the sideline. And we running up and down the court. We doing our drills, two on two, two on one, uh, three on two, uh, five on oh, five on five. And we see this shadow just going back and forth, up and down the court out of our, our rear view. And we like, our side, we like, what is that? What's going on over there? And we see KG in a full sweat, dripping, <laughs> foaming out the mouth, sliding, running, jumping, oh doing sprints. I'm like, what, what is going <laughs> on? And then, KG, and then Doc said, hold up, stop practice. He went over there, KG, what you doing? He's like, I'm taking a day off. <laughs> I'm not playing with y'all. I'm doing my own thing. We said, no, oh, no, that ain't how we wanted you to have a day off. So Doc said, you know what? KG ain't going to let us practice, so we're going to have to call it. So Doc all practice and sent everybody home and kicked KG literally out of the building. Love it, man. I love it. See, I, the, the, the thing that people don't understand about KG, man, is you don't have to have ever played with him to just love mm -mm. and wish you could have played with him. Yeah. Not even run up and down the court with him, but just be in that presence. Cause he, he is all about work. He's yeah. all about putting in that work and effort to be the best version. As coaches like to say these days, be the best version of who you are. Yeah. KG was living. That's, that's how he lived. That's yeah. how he played the game. He played the game tough. Mm. Man. And, mm. and I idolized that because I was coming up. I knew I worked hard. I used to get up at 5 in the morning and do defensive slides with no ball and then go to school. We didn't shoot or nothing. I seen KG work at it, but his, his, his connectedness and his passion to the game. It's like when, a, when a, he's, really, he's really, really, really focused when, the game, when it's game day. And I seen KG slap the phone out a couple of people's hands when they were walking around on the phone. <laughs> people coming to try to get meals before players slap the food out their hands. Like, hey, hey you stay. Uh -uh. You ain't coming in here eating before us. <laughs> we work hard. We put our, our blood, sweat, tears into this. I was like, KG, mm -hmm. I had to throw my phone in the back. And I was like, oh, <laughs> Put it away. I ain't got no phone. Let me put that, <laughs> put that thing. You know, I, you know I'm saying? This town business over here. But I was right. like, you know what? I'm, I got to put this thing away. You know, he, he want to win. And we all got to have that mentality if we want to get to where we need to go. Man, I love it. Right. Inspiration. Second game, pick and roll. You pick a player and tell them what tell us why you're rolling with them. Who do you think is stronger? KG or Big Baby? Because uh, you know baby. what I'm thinking with that one. Yeah, man. I know. <laughs> I know. Um I think Big Baby was he was strong. He was tough uh down low and everything when he's going to the uh basket. I'm gonna give it to KG only, only because 
KG beat us all in God dang it arm wrestling on the plane. I was so mad. Ooh, yeah. you know, I'm like, what the heck? You know, beat everybody. Beat His little KG. arm. Yeah. I'm like, what do you have? Like uh, like like some inner strength or something? He was like, man, that's that grown man. Some pre work work out before. You. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember when I went against Malik Rose and he he posted me up. I thought I was strong, and then he get a layup. He's Slapped me on the butt. He said, "Man, that's that grown man strength. I got five kids." I was like, "Huh?" I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't understand it. Now I understand when I see. Now you know. Oh this, yeah. This baby, and, and, and and he couldn't it, he couldn't win. KG won that, and I was like, "Hey, I thought baby was stronger. I thought I was stronger than KG." I was like, "What? Uh, this is not no contest." But he he's like, "No, that's a that's a heart of a lion. That's a champion." But you know, he's sweating everything on the table. You know how he do it. Foaming at the mouth, man. You like it. Maybe I'm gonna just let go because I don't want your sweat on it. It wasn't no virus then, but maybe it was back then too. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue. Oh gosh. No, no can't, can't, I'm the I'm the hey, silverback. Cleaning nothing either. <laughs> hey, we gotta get on that, y'all. Stay cleaning them planes and everything. For sure. Oh, yeah. For sure. Well, I wipe everything down. I got the gloves yeah. on. Yeah, but remember back in the day, we wasn't even doing that. We wasn't that man. Mm. Like, touching the same cards, passing the same money around, playing yeah. blue -ray. I'm like, come on, man. We wouldn't even doing that. But y'all yeah. also together all the time. And you were usually on like a charter. So it was a little different. At least you're not like with strangers that you don't yeah. know what those people are yeah. doing at all. That, 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 <laughs> you that, were true. Right. That, that is true. That is true. So yeah, I'm going to roll with uh, KG on that one. I reluctantly to say that. Reluctantly. Now, but I'm going to roll. <laughs> I'm gonna roll with him on that. I, I I just remember hearing that that story and thinking like, wait a minute, wait 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 a minute. Man, I, I'm still the same, man. I, man, I I was doing push-ups every night, y'all. I did push-ups <laughs> on my plane. I was I hey I was strong as heck too. I was dunking on fools in practice, tearing the rim off almost. I was like, ain't no way in that KG could beat me. Right. Yeah, I man, that grown that grown man strength is real, grown man. man strength. I didn't know how many kids he had at the time, but I didn't ask him because I didn't want to get all <laughs> personal business. But I was like, yeah, it may, it may be a reason. You know, he might have a few kids, like Malik Rose told me. <laughs> didn't understand. Oh. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wow, we um, this was good, man. I enjoyed this. We didn't even talk about well, actually, you know, I wanted to ask you about your boy, uh, Mr. Lynch, the other beast mode. Um, oh, that's beast mode, yeah. yeah. How good a basketball player was he? Because I know he played with you for a little Look, bit. It, I played with everybody. I mean, beast mode, beast mode, uh, was a good basketball player. Defense, uh, can rebound, can dunk, he can do a little bit of everything. He was like a little muscle out there on the court, though. And I remember. And, and I know how he doing in football. He's real physical. Mm -hmm. so I got found heck of hard, right? And then and then Beast Mode looked at me. He said, "I got you." I said, "I said, I said, hold up, hold up, no, wait, no, I, I don't know, Mister. I don't think no. That ain't what I'm talking. You shouldn't do that. I know you're you're. I got you. He said, like, "I got you." So oh. the next play, Beast, Beast Mode checked in. The next play, why? The dude that hit me got a breakaway. He picked the ball in midcourt. Beast mode was all the way at the uh, under the court. He was so fast too. He sprinted. I said no, no. I was on the <laughs> I was trying to yell out no, no, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's basketball. He speared that man right into the, the whole stand back in the hit his head. He speared him like Goldberg back on wrestling. Hey, he speared that man. I was like that. All the crowds jump up and you know where. When um in Oakland, when that happened, all the crowds ready to fight because yep. that's how we yep. do it. That's how you do it in Oakland. Hey, in, in, in the building, the parents, everybody who in there, they ready to fight. We had security everywhere, but it was so crazy. And I'm like, Beast Mode think when he said, I got you, that means he was going to go you tackle somebody. You. And I mm. knew he was going to go tackle somebody, but I couldn't stop him because coach subbed him in real quick. But he was a good basketball player. Um, And I had a lot of people, my AU team, we was ranked number one in the country too. We had a lot of people on my AU team. I was I came up with a lot of these guys, but uh Bron and uh, uh Kendra Perkins was on my AU team. They changed the rules because of us and, and still stand to this day. So I appreciate that, y'all. Y'all y'all took everybody <laughs> off my team. Was an AAU? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> AAU. They took everybody off my team saying we was cheating. So mm -hmm. you know, you, we smacked Dwight Howard in them by 50. <laughs> and everybody couldn't believe it. They was like, uh, what the heck? We got to break up this team. This ain't fair. 
No, no, oh, so no. Tell, what I tell people, so in other words, you guys were the Brooklyn Nets before the Brooklyn Nets were yeah, the Brooklyn yeah. Nets. You know what I tell you know what I tell people when they say that wasn't fair? I said life ain't fair. So never has been, never will be. You better get with the program because hey, life hits you like a ton of bricks. And that's what I told them, but they wanted to still take that. They still took everybody off my team. So I tried. I tried the last minute. I tried <laughs> beat man. Beat man. <laughs> So you got to be on the team within the hundred mile radius. You uh, you can't be you can't can't be from way out of state. If it ain't a hundred mile radius, you can't play for that team. So I get it. Everybody, y'all welcome. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Leon Poe, Celtics legend. Good to have you, bro. This was this was good, it's been, man. It's been a pleasure, y'all. I, I, I like y'all having me on. Appreciate that. Um, you know, you always come on talk talk some stuff every now and then. You know how I do it. I do. You no, know, you know, I'm with the seeds, so it's some stuff I can't say. You know, I'm with right. them seeds, but you know, we 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 kept it cool. We kept yeah. it cool. Absolutely. And I heard y'all I heard y'all talking about the, the private conversation stuff, which you know with rap reporting oh, them yeah. which, mm -hmm. which I, you know that conversation when something is private, you mean to stay private. But absolutely I understand where some people was coming from with the Donald right. Sterling stuff because that wasn't that was a private conversation too as well that was taped. But he was on some other stuff. So Racist. You know, okay. it's, a fine, it's a fine line. Yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah, it's a fine true. line. But when players and you know when players we gotta know we on a higher, you know, we on a higher profile level. So mm -hmm. We can't be getting into it, even if it's with another actor or another player. You got and we know he's a troll, so like, yeah. why would you, you know, click yeah, into you that? Got, beat? You got a lot, lot. To, you got a lot to lose, and I know Katie. Yeah. You know him. He 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 he'll go at anybody. Right. Mm. I tell you this one thing. I tell you one thing. You talk about my wife, my kids, or anybody, and you say you're gonna spit on me. You already know, old Poe over here coming to see you. Right. Hey, 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 hey you don't Leon. Want to look. We yeah. come to your doorstep. Uh, hey, it, oh, Poe coming to see you. you, you they, 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 they got to understand. You from Oakland. You from yeah. Oakland. We coming to your door. Just, just we, we'll find your address. We coming to your door. <laughs> it won't be nobody. It'll be a one on one. Right. One -on -one. We just want to talk. <laughs> just communicate. Yeah. yeah it, it just be on you want to say that again? Yeah. I'm here now. Yeah, but we, we don't want it to come to all that. We got to right. understand how to be respectful when we talk to one another. That's all. Exactly. Absolutely. 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 Leon Pump. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all having me though.